Welcome one, welcome all, welcome to another exciting episode of the Star Citizen Alpha Boot Camp. Today, we're continuing our look at the backstory of Star Citizen. Hello everyone, I am Bridger, and this is the last in a three-part series exploring the history of Star Citizen. You should definitely click the link on your screen and go back and start with part one if you haven't seen the first two parts. And now we finally have our time machine up and working again, so let's tune back in to that lecture from 2944. It wasn't long until Messer applied his tactical brilliance to the political landscape and transformed the united planets of Earth into the united empire of Earth with himself as the all-powerful Imperator. This is certainly the beginning of one of the darkest periods in human history. The fall of the representative federal system into an autocratic police state is one that people never quite see coming until it's too late. Over the next 50 years, the government of the UEE becomes all-powerful, with no one able to stand up to the Messer dynasty. Oh, there are attempts by freedom fighters, and a few of Messer's descendants were assassinated while in office, some by their own family members in a bid for power. But Messer's legacy would continue, and indeed strengthen, over the coming century. In 2603, the Second Tevaran War breaks out. It's now been about 50 years since their defeat at the hands of Ivar Messer, and they have spent that entire time on the fringes of human space, repopulating and rebuilding an armada. The sole purpose of this fleet is to recapture their homeworld, Kalith, which we now know as Elysium IV. This sudden, unprovoked attack only strengthens the grip of the Imperator. Fear of invasion creates a sense of patriotism, and many are willing to ignore the trespasses of the government if only it will protect them from the alien menace. Unfortunately for the Tevarin, not enough has changed in their favor. Indeed, the human military has in fact increased in size and power in the 50 years since the first Tevarin War. The war lasts for four years before it becomes clear that the Tevarin cannot win. The Tevarin make a final, desperate push to get to their homeworld. Their mindset at this point is, if we can't live there, we will die there. Around 30% of their fleet actually does make it to Elysium IV, and they scuttled their ships into the planet itself. This moment is immortalized in the famous painting, Tears of Fire by Aaron Fring. The following 200 years are filled with anti-alien propaganda, pro-government propaganda, atrocities, injustices, and corruption run rampant. It is a period of absolute autocracy. Anyone who speaks out against the government is quickly discredited or silenced. One of the most prominent examples of this is that of Senator Asan Kiran of Terra. He publicly denounced the pro-military agenda of the UEE and its unconditional support for the military-industrial complex. He attempted to organize a vote of sovereignty for Terra and its adjacent systems. Unfortunately, the state-controlled media quickly labeled him as a traitor who was working with the Xi'an to destabilize the UEE government prior to an invasion. This is also used as an excuse to round up all the other public figures who supported Kieran. The senator disappears, and it is widely believed that he was silenced by the government, along with all of his supporters. Unfortunately, only the people closest to the scene knew the truth. Most of the human population read and believed the media and the government propaganda. Anyone who tried to argue against the official story soon found themselves under arrest for outrageous charges of child molestation, adultery, or treason. For this reason, people only ever heard the official story, and thus, there was no reason to doubt it. Now, I don't mean to say that all of humanity simply played along like sheep. There was always an underground movement of people who knew the real truth. They simply had no way to challenge the power of the government without spreading the word. And they couldn't spread the word without being exposed and silenced by the government. 
Senator Kieran's sacrifice opened the eyes of many and might have started a slow change in public opinion. Unfortunately, there was yet another die to be cast, and it was set to fall in favor of the Imperators yet again. In 2681, the first Vandal attacks began. This was a perfect opportunity for the government to tighten its grip in the name of security. The Vandal themselves are a nomadic race, seeming to have no homeworld nor inhabited worlds at all. They live on massive carriers and travel in fleets representing clans. Uh, they raid and scavenge for their raw materials. Many attempts have been made at diplomatic relations, but none have ever been successful. The Vandal raids only escalate over the next century, and finally, cracks are beginning to show in the iron grip of the Imperators. The UEE military can't seem to stop the Vandal attacks. Activist groups start speaking out and evading capture. The resources of the totalitarian government are stretched thin. Between fighting the Vandal on one side and holding a cold war with the Xi'an on the other, with civil unrest brewing everywhere in between. It will only take a few decisive actions and events for everything to come tumbling down. In 2789, the Imperator's authority is brought directly into question when Senator Terence Akari of Terra brokers peace with the Xi'an on behalf of humanity. Terran political figures start speaking out, blasting Earth for being imperialistic and short-sighted. At this point, it's looking very much like a civil war between Earth and Terra is about to begin. But before that can happen, a crucial event takes place in 2792, in what's known today as the Massacre of Geron II, a corporation begins to terraform another inhabited planet, this time with governmental approval. The inhabitants were not star travelers like the Xi'an. They were just a developing race. They are wiped out by the terraforming process. Now this all would have been rumor and speculation crushed by the propaganda machine of the government, if not for the activist group known as the Rising Tide. The Tide leaked vid footage of the aliens displaying rational, intelligent behavior, including the use of crafted tools. It is then further revealed that the corp responsible is closely tied to the Imperial family. This is the final straw. The people on Earth rise up and overthrow the government of the UEE. At this point, Aaron Toy of Earth becomes the new Imperator and promises an age of enlightenment and social consciousness. Toy establishes term limits for the Imperator, restores the Tribunal, and ensures that the Tribunal will always have the power to remove the Imperator if they all act together. This reestablishes the UEE throughout all of the human systems, including Terra. Humanity still carries guilt from those atrocities to this very day. But that guilt was especially strong right after the fall of the Messer dynasty. Just three years after the fall in 2795, the Fair Chance Act is ratified, decreeing that it is a capital crime to attempt to terraform planets with developing life. These planets are to be left alone to give the species a chance to advance. Another result of humanity's guilt was the space station known as the Ark. For those of you that don't know, the Ark is a massive station built in neutral space where all species are welcome to learn from one another and sort out diplomatic solutions to interspecies problems. It was constructed in the year 2800 and still remains to this day, a lasting achievement of human progress. The final major enterprise that can be called a direct result of humanity's guilt over the Messer era is Project Archangel. Though you probably know it as the Synth World Project. It's an attempt to create an artificial world. An attempt at penance for the worlds we wrongly terraformed. The promise was simple. Instead of risking the destruction of new forms of life, we could build our own world from scratch. It was and is a very ambitious project, for though it was started over 60 years ago in 2872, 
it still hasn't been completed. Every decade, we're told that they've run into new problems, and they only need another decade to sort them out. And every decade, we continue to fund it. It's certainly a lovely idea, but at this point, we're just throwing good money after bad. And it's time we put it to rest. All right, that's it for today, class. You should all have a syllabus for the semester downloaded to your glass. If you don't, you can retrieve it from the class spectrum page. You'll also find a link to the video of the pale blue dot speech I mentioned at the beginning of class. See you next time. Thanks for joining us on this long ride through the lore of Star Citizen. We'll get back to our regular schedule here with the Alpha Boot Camps, alternating each week with the podcast episode. Check out our next episode on exploration and detection in the Star Citizen universe. But for now, this is Bridger, signing off. Have a good one, everybody.